Welcome to our second episode of Character Evolution Cast, everyone. Today's special episode features John Adamus, and he has some excellent advice on fleshing out your characters to make them more three-dimensional. Um, a quick reminder to everybody who has not seen me shout about it on Twitter already, um, but I will be at Gen Con in August. Um, I will be part of the One Shot Network panel, which is on Saturday night or Saturday evening, um, starting at five o'clock. And as of right now, when we're recording this, there are still some tickets left. So if you guys are going to Gen Con and are interested in seeing me or anybody else on the network, um, you can go ahead and try and get tickets to that event. If there aren't any available, you can get generic tickets. And hopefully, if there's some room, we can let you in. Um, otherwise, if you want to just send me a message on Twitter or something and see if we can find time to say hi, I would love to do that. I'd love to meet some of you guys. Yeah, I would be there as well, but my wife and I are literally having a baby right around that time, so... Priorities, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we also have a review for you today. Uh, this one is from Richard Crates Landry, and his review is titled, So Much Fun. And this is from the USA. He says, It's what it says on the tin, and more. A podcast where the hosts get together with folks who are passionate about a particular role-playing game system and create characters in it, but also a look into what the process says about the games as well. If you are looking for discussions about a broad variety of games, analysis of what makes them unique, and how the process of creating your character informs the expectations of those games have for play, or just a conversation with people who really love the games they've come to talk about, you'll find it here. The audio is good quality, the editing is solid, the guests are great, and each series comes with extra links in the show notes. It's good stuff top to bottom. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Richard. We love you. Well, with that out of the way, let's get to the show. To character evolution cast a show where we discuss what to do with all those characters we just made i'm one of your hosts ryan and today my co-host amelia and i are joined by john adamus game designer editor and creative coach to discuss how to make your characters three-dimensional john welcome to character evolution cast thank you so much for joining us oh thank you so much for having me it's great to be here can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and some of the cool stuff that you are involved in? If you're coming to this from the gaming industry, as I suspect many people are, you've seen my work editorially in things like The Early Fate Worlds, Dinocalypse Now by Chuck Wendig, some of the text boxes in Knights Black Agents and some of the work in the Knights Black Agents Supplement Double Tap. You've seen my work in Marvel Super Heroic Role Playing from Margaret Weiss. You've seen some of my work in Time Watch. You've seen some of my work in Mark Richardson's Headspace. You've seen some of my work in uh, Room 209 Gaming's Forthright. You've probably seen my own stuff, uh, particularly Noir World. You've seen, oh gosh, I've just been, it's been a very busy several years. So you have it's very likely that you've seen my stuff somewhere. I just saw your name in the Knights Black Agents book the other day because we've been playing that for another podcast that I'm on and I opened Ooh. it up and it was right in there. I was like, oh, look at that. <laughs> I, I That was one of my earliest sort of accidental jobs. One of our goals on our show, uh, aside from making amazing characters, is to introduce our audience to people who are doing some awesome things in the RPG world. So we want to start by getting to know you. We usually start with an easy question. How did you get here? How did you get into RPGs? Why are you on our podcast? Well, I, I I can probably guess that I'm on your podcast because I love the sound of my own voice. I got into gaming very, very early. I got into gaming around age 12 or 13, maybe 14. It's a little fuzzy. It's that early preteen haze of 
of hormones and zits and friendlessness. And uh, role playing gaming became sort of the hot thing in uh, in town where the, when the comic book store opened uh, above the yogurt shop downtown and it became just the hot place for nerds and people who weren't cool enough to play sports in town. And I got the book. I picked up. I started with second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and worked my way through that entirely because the books were substantial. They felt heavy. So I assumed, much like at the library, bigger books must be cooler books. So <laughs> I I went for all the pretty heavy substantial books like all the AD&D stuff. Then I got into Rifts because you have aliens and soft cover books. And I got all of those. And then I got I got into GURPS and I got most of those. And I didn't really start playing them. I just started sort of hoarding them. I guess I wanted to make like a book <laughs> fort. It like didn't... you were the dragon and those right. were your treasures. Exactly. I was just going <laughs> to just going to lounge upon them and people might draw me like one of their French girls. It was just sort of a mess. <laughs> and then eventually um, when it occurred to me that I really didn't have that many friends at the time, I should do something with these books. And I, I had a younger brother. I still have a younger brother. Let's not make him sound like he's no longer here. But my younger brother thought it was really cool that they had this, you know, there are games in these things. and There's not like board games. This is neat. So he and I ran for years a two person, seven character each second edition game. And oh, that wow. was That's sort nuts. of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that in the nicest way, but no, that's no, nuts. no, it is. It was it was completely <laughs> like two really lonely kids who um well my brother was pretending to be lonely cuz he didn't want me to feel bad because he had friends and he was very popular. He was the very like big outgoing gregarious kid and I was not. So he went he would hang out reluctantly for a little while with his older brother and play these games and tell these very intense melodramatic stories and then run off and go be popular. But by the time that struck, then I got in, of course, into, uh, as I think every teenager does, I got into vampire because I really felt like leather and pale things spoke to me on a deep internal live journal level. Right. And you were super individualistic about that. You were like, this makes me special for right. everybody else, yes. too. Because, right. <laughs> yeah. because while everybody was being the the sort of uh, – I was a Nosferatu because I felt it really reflected my inner issues with beauty and appearance, whereas everybody was a much prettier Ventru. But there I was being the ugly disfigured <laughs> one because that spoke to me, man, on the inside. I sort of fell into gaming because – it, the alternatives were staring at the wall and watching grass grow. So it seemed to be the thing to do when you weren't really sure where all your friends were going because it seemed wherever they went, they found things like dates and parties and a social life. And I didn't know what store they bought it at. I didn't have a coupon code. I didn't, I didn't know the first thing about it. So I just had these books. And I had a very active imagination and I thought, oh, well, this is totally fine and normal, at least until I left, until I got through most of high school. And then suddenly it occurred to me that there are people of another gender to whom I am attracted and they're probably not going to be deeply interested in my long saga of, you know, that time I played 7th C for two weeks. So... <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I should put some of these things down and try to socialize with other humans. It didn't go very well, like like at all. So I did my best and, uh, well, kind of gave up for, oh, I don't know, seven years because I was older and way too cool for that. Obviously, way too cool for gaming because that's that's what I did as a kid. And now now I'm a grown adult at 18 and I know everything. And besides, there's like the internet and and girls and I was in college and there were no unhealthy toxic parental relationships to dictate how I use my time. So I could just girls and internet all day when that crashed and burned because apparently when you go to college, you're supposed to go to classes every once in a while. Who knew? I've heard that. Yeah, that I, yeah. You know what? I don't get it either. But hey, apparently that's what you're supposed to do. So when that didn't work for me, I came back and regrouped 
and was like, I need something to do. Well, what can I do with my free time and no friends? Oh, my God, I have these whole cases full of books. Let's get back into gaming. And eventually it was an on again, off again thing for years and years and years until one day I went to a, a gaming convention and raised my hand during a panel and then sort of found myself in the industry about four hours later. I heard you tell the the more involved part of that raising your hand at a panel on um, talking tabletop with Jim McClure at one point too. And I feel like it's so important for people to realize that a lot of the opportunities that people get in life are because you raised your hand or you sent a message or you whatever, because you put yourself out there and said, hey, I can maybe do that. I think people spend a lot of time going, why are all these other people getting these opportunities to do these things and I'm not? And it's like, well, did you ask? You Did you offer? Well, no. Okay. Well, nobody's coming to your house to ask you like, hey, John, do you want to edit my book? It doesn't work like that until you're established a little bit. But sometimes just raising your hand or just like sending a message and saying, hey, what about me? Is enough to get you involved in something that ends up being a lifelong career. Well, I I wasn't the sort of person who would raise their hand. That was never me because I, I learned from an early age, if you raise your hand, you get in trouble. Even if you have the right answer, there's some negative consequence to being spotted, to being visible. Despite a real deep, like internal, much therapy need to be visible and be seen and, and be recognized. But raising my hand in general became in the last maybe two to three years, granted I'm almost 40 now. So in the last two to three years, raising my hand really became the thing I had to pivot towards rather than away from. So now it's a thing. If you ever find me on social media, I'm all about raising hands. I'm all about going and saying and challenging and go do the thing and do a lot of the thing and do the thing in the face of your fears and, you know, do the thing even when you don't have shoes on and and go do. I think that's really how I've had to redefine myself in the last couple of years. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage to do it, but it's definitely, I've found in my own experience at least, pretty worthwhile once you once you get up that courage to oh, do it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. you're going to find far more success by looking than waiting. Yes. And so part of that's got to be proactivity. You've got to go out and do. The same way, because now I can bring it full circle, the same way we have our characters go off and quest mightily and go do the thing that the person at the end of the table is rolling dice about. We too, the people, must go forth, occasionally leave our homes or leave our comfort zones and go try our stuff out in the world. That's true. Nobody plays an RPG about staying home and making a cup of coffee. I mean, there probably is a game for that, let's be honest, but that's not the one that most people are playing. I'd play the hell out of it. Absolutely, I would. Absolutely, (laughs) I would. Since you have such a rich history with all these role-playing games and all the different ones that you have mentioned before, can you tell us about your favorite character that you've made before? I am so ready for this question. I tried to, first of all, I tried to count the number of characters I've made across every game I've ever played. Not the ones I've edited, just the ones I've played either as a GM or a player. And I I couldn't. My gaming group for many years had a very bad case of start it, try it, get bored with it, discard it. So it never really, we would do three week sessions of a lot of things that could have been great had we, you know, done four weeks or five or even two and a half. Mm -hmm. But I think my favorite character of all time, the one I still get grief from, from my friends, was I had a second, in second edition, I had a a lawful, what we refer to as the lawful stupid paladin. His name was uh, Thodar Thaddeus Thinder III, son of Thodar Thaddeus Thinder II. And he was a paladin, I believe, of Torm. And for everything that happened in the campaign, his title grew. So... Oh, every, no. every action, oh, no. everything that succeeded. Oh, we've chased, you know, hooligans out of a bar. I am Thodor Thaddeus Thinder the Third, son of Thodor Thaddeus Thinder the Second. He who chases brigands from the bar, and it would just grow. And it became, I think, at one point, if I could still find it, it's it's up somewhere on a Yahoo group. It was about seven to eleven pages, and it was about forty five seconds of title. That was my favorite character ever because. I very, at the time, was never playing the traditional straight man role. I was always sort of the the wacky, zany rogue or the really serious wizard. So it was a nice 
huge deviation for me to be this sort of like square jawed, golly gee, everything is swell and everybody's good paladin who was just so trusting. And yes, of course, rogue, I should be less encumbered. Please hold all the party's money and then I will be free to hold an even bigger sword. The, the reason why I, I struggled to pick this is because I also had a superhero character named Hostage. And I believe this was in Champions. I spent all my uh, time building up so that the character was just immortal. could not Could not die. You could cut him apart. You could butcher him, do whatever. But he couldn't die. And he was the most depressed character I've ever played. He sounded like Eeyore. Okay, I'll go stand in front of the bazooka. And that was his thing. He would purposefully jump in harm's way while every other character was being force, you know, four color and stars and spangles. I was the mopey sort of like, oh, all right, I'll do it. I, I adored both of those characters so, so very much. But choosing between the two, Thodar is my favorite because the second, I believe it was the second adventure we ever had, uh, my friend Mike was GMing at the table I'm currently sitting at. And we were – we had come into town late at night. There were, I believe, some sort of undead presence rising from the cemetery and terrorizing the townsfolk. And we had all taken shelter in the in the tavern as one group does. And I looked out the window and there saw uh, some sort of undead leadership sort of striding ardently through the field of tombstones. And I said to the – you know, I said to the townsfolk who were all cowering and looking to the paladin to be noble and brilliant. Oh, don't worry, everybody. It's probably just a vampire. You only have like a 70 percent chance of dying. This is going to be great. And everyone dissolved into grand peals of laughter for 15 minutes. I made my friend Mike uh, do that sort of take his glasses off and pinch the bridge of his nose thing for the first time in what became a running count over a decade of how many times can John make Mike make that face. I adored doing that every week. Every Thursday, I'm going to make Mike make that face. Let's go. Was that one of those moments where you're like, this is what I want in a game? Like, this is what I Absolutely. want gaming to be like for I, I, I was, I was so less concerned with like, oh my God, if I just get to this level, I'll have this ability. Well, that's that's all great, well, and good. But mostly, I just like making people at the table have a good time so whether that's making mike just <sighs> heave these intense sort of massive oh my god john i spent all week preparing for this and you're not getting on the boat no i'm not getting on the boat i want to ford the river um just just to give him you know fits and then to turn to turn to the people at my table and go you know what we should do we should just camp here Forget the rest of the adventure. Let's just stop and see what happens. Not in a malicious way. It was never malicious. Gaming for me has never been about competition and it has never been about sort of superiority or some sort of dice genital waving contest. It has always been a matter of like how much fun are we having and how can what can we do and how can we go about having even more fun hierarchically. It really helped heal me. When I was home from college feeling like a failure, feeling like I didn't know what to do, working terrible jobs selling furniture and towels at the mall, feeling like I'd never fit in anywhere. I could have this game for a few hours and I could make six people laugh or eight people laugh. So gaming became uh, salvation and a life raft. And it wasn't until way later, like maybe five years ago, I started to look at it and go, oh, wait, all the all the principles of storytelling are here. I can finally fuse like the stuff I did learn in college with everything else I'm doing. And it was a really good pivotal crucible for me. That's awesome. I, I love that gaming can do that, that it can take those things. You know, you can have that minute of like time away and sort of like refresh and just hang out and have fun, but also learn stuff about yourself in the process, but in a way that you never would have done if it weren't a game, right? Because I think that there's all these times where you're like, ah, I know myself, I know all these things, I know who I am. But then you can have that minute of doing something really cool in a game and this like aha moment mm -hmm. of like, oh, I didn't oh, know anything at all. You can, <laughs> I, I always walked around being like, oh, well, I'm I'm just a smart guy who doesn't socialize well, but everybody keeps saying real positive things about me and I can make people laugh 
and I like this gaming thing, and I guess that's where I'm making everybody laugh, so I guess I'm only funny on Thursdays if I'm holding dice in my hand. I'm only cool because I'm playing the cool character at the table, and it never it never really stuck until until really I started working in it and working with all these different people and seeing that it was fun in a different way it was fun to play absolutely always is but it was also fun to go okay what's your idea what do you want to do that sounds amazing how can we get that into the world in a way that makes sense to not just you because you've seen it before like how can we make new people excited about this how can i hand this to a person who's never done it before and how much fun will they have and and that's where things really took off for me And that actually kind of ties into our next question that I wanted to ask you. Most of your work right now in in the last couple of years has been helping other people achieve their creative goals, um, whether it's through editing things like Fate Worlds or Headspace or through the, the coaching that you do now. But what is your favorite thing that you have created? See, this was the question I actually agonized over to the point where I was ready to like call my therapist because I I really (laughs) anguished over this. You could say really easily like, oh, well, clearly it's got to be Noir World. It was a very successful Kickstarter and the the PDF is in people's hands and soon the book will go to, you know, shipped across everywhere. And that's, that's true. I'm very proud of that book, but it's no longer my favorite. It was my favorite when I was writing it. It was my favorite when I was playtesting it. But there, there came that moment where it pivoted from thing John is doing to product. I, I really languished over what my favorite thing was. And I, I have to be a terrible guest, and I'm so sorry. But I have two things because I just don't know which to pick. If we're, if we're looking strictly at gaming, uh, from 2000, let's say 2001, 2002 up to 2007, I ran a complete Palladium campaign. I took every Palladium game and mashed them all together. I had champions. I had rifts. I had Beyond the Supernatural. I had uh, Super Spies. Mm-hmm. I had Teeny Mutant and other, and, and other <laughs> Strangeness. I had – if 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 uh, Kevin Simbeta created it and there was a Palladium word on it, I own it. Um, I took all the Palladium <laughs> stuff and I mashed it together and I created a continuous campaign. We started off in rifts as – level one regular people or some aliens. Oh, wow. And we just went forward. And I wrote a 47-page timeline from the start, from the dawn of existence up through whatever the current day was in six-month intervals. I remember a few events from, from from the later part of the timeline. Hawaii was a sentient set of rock elementals who came to life and, and left the planet Earth. And just sort of um, took every brought everything together, brought in superheroes, brought and this was the uh, the the years where you could get a ton of uh, riffs material online in netbooks. So I would just uh, this was before Google. So I was Alta Vista ing and uh, Lycos ing <laughs> and and finding all these netbooks of different OCCs and RCCs and like you want to be a Highlander you can be a Highlander we just killed your last character be a Highlander this time or or be the Submariner <laughs> or be the you know because people came up with all manner of things and I uh, I was determined to have this whole campaign come together and uh, the only thing that stopped it was we suddenly became very very interested in Star Wars so we transitioned from we we had the we created Star Wars uh, uh originally West End D6 characters come in and kill off our Rifts characters and then <laughs> move oh. forward into Star Wars D6 and then ultimately into uh D20 before it became I think it's Saga. This was pre-Saga. This was first go round of Star Wars D20. That I think was my greatest gaming accomplishment, and certainly I'm I'm still proud of it, even if I can't remember the entirety of everything. But I I remember the number of profuse compliments I would get for Wow, John, that NPC speech sounds exactly like a president who's becoming a dictator. Wow, John, that alien description was really really evocative. I I mm-hmm. think those are my proudest moments. That sounds. I mean, that's how long did that campaign go on uh seven years eight years oh my gosh yeah every uh it started off on every thursday and then we moved to sundays and then we moved to saturdays contingent on when people had day jobs because Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. i worked at the mall selling furniture and towels those are my dark years and (laughs) um i hated it oh god i hated it 
And and they had like day job day jobs with like hours and they had to tuck their shirts in and wear name tags and be official at cubicles. And I sold towels. But we kept that thing running almost every week uh, except for Christmas. We took a week off for Christmas and New Year's and we would take a week off in July because not enough people were around. But yeah, I kept that thing. Is it thing. the same group of people pretty much the whole time too? Yeah, give or take one or two people who would drop in and drop out is like, you know, they got married or they wow. had kids or one guy That's took crazy. a job across the country. We we just kept going. So that was one thing. Oh, right. <laughs> so um, Do you want to say the second one? <laughs> well, yeah. On the blo- on my blog and it's still there today. Uh, I rewrote the Star Wars prequels in a way that I was that was really interesting because uh, I oh. went on record as being very uh, anti prequel, but not in a sort of like this like Jar Jar is offensive and there's too much CGI way because that's what everybody else was doing. I came at it from a very mm-hmm. strong like if we're going to tell a good story, uh, these are the things we need like a plot and conflict. And well-defined characters mm-hmm. and and stakes and danger and maybe some sensible boundaries on what we can and cannot have. And so I and an re- editor, maybe and an editor, maybe, maybe an editor, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe somebody to pare it down so that it doesn't feel like I'm watching C SPAN with lightsabers and and then like make it feel Star Warsy. So I rewrote all three prequels, focusing it on Obi-Wan Kenobi. So when I rewrote the prequels, I decided that, oh, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to lean in and focus, make it Obi-Wan's story because if if the original trilogy is Darth Vader's story, as a lot of story developers can make a strong case that it is, the prequels then mm-hmm. should be Obi-Wan's story because it's Obi-Wan that precipitates the fall of Darth Vader. So let's lean into that and let's bring in all the things from Clone Wars and Rebels wasn't a thing yet, but mostly Clone Wars and and the comics and the the old comics and Dark Horse and and the old Marvel stuff and the the old Tales from the Cantina books. And I I drew heavily from everything and rewrote it, made Anakin – uh, he was never a kid. There's no pod racing. I don't remember if I wrote Jar Jar in. I might have killed him off. doesn't really matter. But I made it a contiguous story that was about Obi-Wan sort of assuming leadership and then letting Anakin kind of develop with him but kind of get out of control and, and sort of pivoting around this. And I made the, the lightsaber fight at the end way more exciting. And I, I gave Jimmy Smith something to do in the story because Jimmy Smith just dresses like Christopher Columbus in the later movies and stands around. And I, I thought that was not great because it's Jimmy Smith and he can act. So I gave mm-hmm. him something to do. And I'm really, really proud of those those three blog posts because I sort of knocked them all out like one after the other in like a two day stretch. Oh, my God, I'm doing the first one. OK, I'm doing the second one. I guess I should do the third one oh, just wow. for con- consistency. He's like, there's, there, I think they're <laughs> maybe 3000 words a piece. They're on the blog somewhere. If you go to my blog oh, nice. and search for Star Wars prequels, they'll pop right up. Um, I'm, I'm ridiculously proud of those. It, uh, those blog posts are one of my first forays into narrative design. I didn't know what it was called then. I, I just thought I was clarifying and fixing the story, which is not normally how I refer to it. Um, yes. but it, <laughs> it is what it is. So I, I just thought I was making it better. I didn't realize there was a term for what I do slash did. Mm-hmm. And, um, I really liked doing it. And then I, I would occasionally watch other horrendous movies and then do the same thing. So that's that's how I got deeper into – well, there has to be a name for this. It can't just be editing. That's really broad because anytime I tell somebody I'm an editor, they could think I'm looking at journalism or print or publication or film or or virtu- visual effects. And I'm like, no, I, I do this one specific thing and I, I didn't quite know what – to call it. So I did some digging and found out there's things like narrative design and story consultation and and story development and book coaching and it sort of the rabbit hole got much much deeper and moved well past editing. And that's sort of where I find myself now. Well, now that we've established who you are and why you are an expert, uh we want to make the most of that expertise. So our goal with these episodes is to help people become the best possible players at the table. And there's tons of GM advice out there, but not nearly as much for players. So on our podcast, we make all kinds of awesome characters, 
but now we need to play them. And we want that experience to be as fantastic as possible for people. I think one of the ways to improve people's experiences is to create a character that is as three-dimensional as possible. So we're going to focus on the that topic and see if we can learn to look past the block of stats and uh, learn how authors in particular create depth for their characters. So, John, I want to start by making sure that everybody's on the same footing. What do we mean when we talk about giving characters depth or making them three-dimensional? That's a great question, Amelia. Really what depth is, is depth is a sense of substance. They have a, a weight. They have a, a feeling that they make an impact in the world. They have the ability to make an impact in the world. They have agency. They're not just sort of hollow chest pieces that are migrating across a sort of flat cookie cutter diorama. They actually move in a world that feels realistic and can be related to. So depth is any sort of uh, concept or building support. Uh, architecture in a character that gives them the opportunity to be more than just uh, a sing what's called a single facing representative. I'm the smart guy. I'm the nerdy girl. These are these are very one sided sort of structural things that sort of give a single view but don't speak to the whole full picture. It's sort of like drawing a square and then saying it's a cube. You just can't see all the other sides. So in order to in order to develop that cube, in order to give it more depth, you've got to look at things well past stat blocks because stat blocks, even when they're numeric, are subjective because um, if you if you say, oh, well, I've got a strength of 18. Oh, OK, what, what is that? What does that do for you? What's in relation to what out of right, how many? Exactly. Like and. Mm -hmm. In my life, how do I – what does a strength of 18 look like? The usual approximation is that uh, if you look in White Wolf in particular sticks out where it was if you have four dots in potence, you are about as strong as such and such. But even that scale is so subjective because clearly some Olympic weightlifters can lift more weight than other Olympic weightlifters because that's how weightlifting works. And so these mm -hmm. these sort of broad subjective terms lose their meaning – if you are not very deeply ingrained in the shorthand the shorthand of utility for them. We know strength of 18 is good because we know what strength can do within the context of the game. But as a descriptor of a character, it's like saying, oh, my character is tall. Well, if, you know, if your character is tall or short, that's got to be relative to something else. Because if you are... 5'1", tall to you might be 5'8", but if you are 6'3", tall to you might be 6'10", and 6'10 might tower over the 4'4 person. So a lot of this terminology, a lot of what makes stat blocks a little limiting, and one of the, one of the things I challenged in game design, at least my own game design, was that you, you don't need stats ultimately. If you need a picture of a character, you've got to think about what a character represents, what goals they have, what they want to do, uh, how they're going to go do them in a given moment, whether that's a scene or around the table or this turn in combat. It's about goals and emotions and philosophies, all the things that make people feel like people. Because ultimately, characters are people, even if they're made up dwarves who are represented in, you know, a, a slightly two inch high plastic figurine with a bad paint job. But you've got to you've got to divorce yourself from the sort of fixed scales and the sliding scales and think about your own sort of personal agenda, what you are going to do, what you want in a scene, what you want overall, and not just I want to make level 10. OK, Why? Ask why. Be willing right. to ask why. Is it just because, oh, well, at level, you know, at level four, I'll be able to turn the undead. Well, is turning the undead important to the character or do you think it's just a cool reason to roll the 20 sided die? And it's OK mm -hmm. if it's just a cool reason to roll the 20 sided die. That's totally fine. Absolutely. Make yourself happy. But if you are looking to simulate a more intense experience, if you're looking to have that sort of like I'm in my character and I'm I'm doing these things and things feel organic, then it is critical that you have a reason for why turning the undead is important. Sometimes when we're younger, we attempt to do this sort of thing by writing really complicated backstory. Uh, backstory is not – the best vehicle for explaining the why of something. 
Backstory is a vehicle for explaining the how we got here. It's important yeah. to turn undead. Why? Because I'm carrying a vendetta against – because the undead ate my puppy. Okay. The backstory explains the mm-hmm. how and the how that felt. But the why, the why is always going to be more present because the why is what has you going forward. The how is how you got here and the, the why is what's ahead of you. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the basis of depth in character, Amelia. That's how we are starting to look at things in a more multifaceted way. All characters have sort of a moral code and a philosophy. Now, alignment in role playing tries to tries to script this out, but it's very broad because what could be lawful good to me mm-hmm. might not be lawful good to you. So you you need to define that more certainly, more individualistically. My character will not mm-hmm. do A, B, and C, and they will do D, E, and F. And when the question comes up why, the answer better not be because I have a troubled and haunted past. That's just weak. That is just a cover that you can quickly breeze past so that you know we can get on to other things. It needs to go past that. The individualization and definition of philosophy is really going to help give that character an on paper or mental umami that really lets people sink their teeth in and feel nourished by this play experience. Those moral quandaries are really important, I think, in in building who people are, because I, I think those difficult choices are the moments where you start to see these are the things that are important to me and this is absolutely who I am. And in the absence mm-hmm. of moral quandary, I think too many people default to either a very comfortable set of tropes or they do default to those stat blocks. Yeah. So I, I know I stretched well past the boundary of your question and I apologize, but but this is this <laughs> this is what I really love to talk about all the time. That's why we yeah, asked you to do it. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's perfectly fine that you stretch past the boundaries because it, it leads directly into our next question. You hinted at it a little bit with the uh, starting with emotion and going on to ambition. Uh, what would be kind of the basic steps that people can use to go and take a character from this block of stats to an actual full person? That's a great question. Step one, don't look at the stats. Put them down. Pretend they're not there. They're going to be there. We'll use them later. But for right now, that's that's not where we're going to look. And we're not going to let those stats and those numbers and those dice rolls and that whatever's, don't let them influence who and what that character could be. I want you to look at the words. And if there aren't words, double bonus because you get to make up words or or maybe not make up words. That might not be the clearest instruction, but certainly you get to use words if words aren't there. To please don't make up your own gibberish words. That just irritates me. <laughs> it's a choose your own adventure. <laughs> yeah, it is. But but not one where you get to make up your own language. So you you put the stats to one side. You put the, the, the constructed, expected building blocks of story uh, – not story. The building blocks of role playing to one side. And we start looking at this character going, okay, what are they? They're, uh, you've got to start with some boundary and some decision. So they're a fighter. Here is their class. Here is their role in the story. Okay. That gives me a starting point. What's something they want? And you, you start asking uh, pr- uh, provocative and intense questions and you, you sort of build into the intensity. Don't jump in right away with the intense stuff because you'll end up writing a character like you're 14 and it's it, it's you're sitting in the dark lit, lighting candles and listening to Coldplay and sort of bemoaning on your live journal why no one understands the ennui of you at the lunch table. <laughs> Maybe I spoke too personally there. But the, the idea... I think we've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. So... You you start asking your character these provocative questions that really help develop and build things like, okay, if I'm a fighter or if I'm the Cthulhu librarian, what do, what do I want? What do I is – it, is, it, is it as simple, air quotes, as I just don't want to die today? Okay. Why is that a why is that a concern? Most people don't live their day to day like I went and got a cup of coffee and then I went over here and had a donut and then I argued with my coworker. Most people don't contend with their life <laughs> at a sort of I don't want to die today level. So what makes that interesting to you? And what decisions can you make because of it? And the more juicy the question, the more intense the question, 
the absolute better off you'll be when you come up with that character because that character is going to then use that question and all those possible answers as lenses through which they can pass the story. Oh my God, I'm a character who doesn't want to die today. There is no way if I'm chased that I'm going to stand there. I'm going to run. I'm going to be the fastest one here. And then we come back to the stats. Oh God, I need to be the fastest one here, but I have the worst speed in the party. All of a sudden now, the stats that we would have previously relied on as structure to help define our character are now defining our character in a negative way as opposed to a positive way. Because I think too many players get locked into the idea of, well, my stats are good, so those are my positives. But stats can equally be, equally be interpreted as possible negatives. I really want to be a character who is healthy and strong, but my constitution is a five. Yeah. And all of a sudden now, are you going to play this as a hypochondriac? Are you going to be the, you know, the underdog who is constantly coughing his way, sort of hunched over and weak, but at the critical moment, you'll stand up and do something amazing? How will you use the combination of stats with the character decisions you've made when you didn't care about the stats to help build a character that is more than just the shell for your hand rolling dice or moving tokens or, or picking up pizza or doing whatever it is you do at your particular game. So you, you, you ask provocative questions. And if you're ever unsure what provocative questions uh, might be, because there's bajillions of them, if your character was a fictitious character who wasn't this, if you weren't your level six fighter, if you weren't the Cthulhu librarian, if you weren't the time watch agent, if you were watching this thing on Netflix or if you were watching this thing on TV, what would that character on screen do? How, how would they think? How would they feel? And then just go do that. One of the things that you wrote recently on your blog, mm -hmm. I think you were particularly talking about side characters and like non-protagonist characters. But one of the questions that caught my eye was what what story do you want to tell? Which I thought was a really interesting question in that we talked a little bit about this when we recorded our L5R episodes, talking about like metagaming a little bit and saying like when you go to write a book, nobody's like, well, I'm just going to sit down. We're going to see what comes out. Like you, you plot it out a little bit. You, you know, roughly where like you want things to go. And I think it's okay to do that with a character too. And to say, you know what, here's where I kind of want to end up. What things do I need to put in place to kind of get there? Few things rub me all the wrong way than someone on social media turning around and saying, I wrote today, but I have no idea what my characters are doing. <laughs> and I, I, I'm at their mercy. No, you're not. No, you are most certainly not. That is not creative. That is an excuse you're making because you need to tone down your own sense of your creativity. So you're making it this projected sort of wild and wackiness. And that, that's not... As I tell my children when they try and use like the, you know, like a passive tone for everything, like it fell off the table... You are the master of your own destiny. That's right. You are in charge of this. So, yes, you, you do on some level outline, even if it's not the, the sort of traditional Roman numeral capital letter structured Roman outline, even if it's bullet points, even if it's like a decision you make two seconds into the start of the game, like today I'm going to make Mike cry. Let's go. Those decisions, even the singular ones, are outlines and, and, and help frame the actions you're going to take. We don't call them outlines because the word outline carries all these connotations. But when I – and it doesn't even matter if it's a secondary character. But when I ask the question, what story do you want to tell? It is a story because it is, well, what's happening today? What's happening right now? And whether right now is a scene in a book or the session around the table or the evening with you and your friends or the day of your week or whatever level of Zoom you want to put on this – You've got a fundamental understanding that you're in charge of it. So you, you adjust and you temper and you, you decide, okay, today's the story where I'm going to do this. I'm going to go be heroic this way. I'm going to go be brave this day. I'm going to go be the best Thodor Thaddeus Thinder the third. I can in my campaign because I think today we're actually going on that new thing Mike has, has designed. But you always get to choose the story for all the characters. So when you have a, a secondary character like Robin to Batman or Chewbacca to Solo, 
what are they they're not just there to take up space and then do the critical thing when the when the when the main character can't oh i just need i wish my arm was an inch longer well i'm right there it's convenient and convenience kills creativity convenience is the hindrance to story because it takes away opportunity risk and danger it makes it less interesting every decision matters in that way then i don't mean to make people feel paralyzed by that oh my god i'm breathing in and out oh god i'm 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 ruining everything no you're just breathing just be cool be fonzy it's gonna be all right just be cool but the thing you need to do is realize that okay if i'm gonna if what what experience do i want to have as a player well, I have to be responsible for my portion of bringing that to life and bringing that out into the world. So what don't I want to do? Well, then clearly I'm not going to go do those things. And if I want to go make sure I get to level three, I guess I better go whack some bad guys with my sword. And or I better make sure this guy doesn't die because he's the only one who could heal me. So I'm going to go be a little bit more intrepid today. So that's that's how you get to frame and tell your story whether at a character or a player or a storyteller or a novelist or a whatever level it's, it's decision-making. It's always decision-making. Well, right. And it, it, a key portion of role-playing games is understanding how cause and effect works, right? Like there's, you know, if I kick down this door, like something is going to happen because if you expected absolutely nothing to happen, you wouldn't do it. Like we wouldn't show up. And so, understanding that every action that you take, whether it's in-game or out-of-game or whatever, is going to have some kind of consequence is important. And I think framing your character in that way and saying, okay, if I want this to be the consequence, if I want this to be the thing, what do I have to do to get there? Right. And it's it's not just, well, I'm going to do whatever's coolest. It's it's bigger than that. Because that's interesting and mm-hmm. that's okay. Uh, and, and sometimes as the cool character, people will just hand you blankets, but you can also be cool in other ways. And sometimes you need to put coolness to the side because coolness can be a vehicle for stealing the spotlight when one of the best activities you could ever do around the table is help position the spotlight. S- sometimes you, you you need to, you know, chill till the next episode, as Dre has taught us, and and give us an opportunity to wait. And let someone else go and then yes and from that and then iterate upon that so that our character can be even better the next Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, like I said, you wouldn't show up if there was, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to sit down at this table and absolutely nothing's going to happen. That would be the most boring game in the Mm -hmm. world and we wouldn't show up. Right. It's, you know, you don't show up for nothing to happen. Like, I'll just stay home. And, yeah. and if somebody is trying to do what a, a good player like you would do, try to shine the spotlight onto you, that's your time to graciously accept the spotlight, I, I would think. Because if everybody around the table is of the mentality of, I'm going to push the spotlight on other people, then the spotlight's never on anybody. You're like swinging it around and everybody's getting dizzy. <laughs> right. I mean, at some point, yes, you do have to be gracious and say, okay, it's my turn. I'm going to make the best of it. I, I will, you know, it's it's the, well, if nobody's going to volunteer, I'm going to raise my hand at the convention mm-hmm. because I the, the Ken Heights point might fall flat if no one raises their hand during this panel. So John's going to sit there in the second row and raise his hand. I'm not going to turn it into the me show, but I'm going to contribute something to this collaboration that will benefit everyone it's not just going to be well pay attention to me for 10 seconds and then i will give you no hooks and no purchase and no space to amend it or interact with it it's just going to be john for woo crazy times and then and then well i guess we'll just sit quietly until it's john (laughs) turns again woo and and that was my preferred play style for way too long (laughs) I think that's how a lot of people start, though, and I've been at a lot of tables like that, that it's like, okay, now I'm, you know, doodling in my notebook or playing Mm -hmm. on my phone or whatever until it's my turn, like, and then you get to the round of combat, like, where are we? What are we doing? Yes. Uh, Yes. And there's nothing more frustrating for all of the other people at the table Mm -hmm. than just waiting for you to get back into it again. And so it's really valuable to offer, even when that spotlight is on you, to kind of offer hooks and draw other people in so that they can play off of you and then eventually maybe you can have a really good storyline 
together at some point that, you know, plays off of each other in a different way. Like you're building those, those steps yeah, for it, later. It's almost like the spotlight is a, a game of catch with your friends. The ball is the spotlight. You have to have the ball at some point to play catch, but you also have to throw the ball to other people. But well, you can't play catch if the ball's sitting in the middle of all your friends on the ground. It has to be passed or caught by people around the table. I've been there. I, I was there well past the little kid stage, and it's way it's way more fun to... I mean, it can be mm-hmm. scary. It can absolutely be scary, especially at a convention game where you don't quite know everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even 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 when I, I mean I, I made a game that's that's fairly collaboratively jammed. There's no singular GM. And that by itself is also really interesting because it forces everyone to pay attention. And it, it doesn't outright penalize people for being on their phone or doodling on the character sheet. Um, but it, it does distract from the desired, hey, we're all making a story here, so it, you're it's about to be your turn. Do something. I wanna ask you what you think players can gain by fleshing out their characters more beyond just the stats on a character sheet. Because I assume when you develop a game, you you make it so that the character sheet should be all you need. So why would we bother to put in this extra work? Like, what are we getting out of it? It's more fun. <laughs> that's the simple answer, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the, better. Re- the really simple answer is it, it allows you to have more fun. Mm-hmm. Um and and for some people that's going to be okay, and some people that's going to be enough. Uh, other people, it's going to be a much tougher sell because they're going to go, well, the character sheet and all the crunchiness can be fun, and that's fine, and that's great. And balancing those two can be can be difficult as part of design. It can be hard as a player to understand, like, well, is this game for me or mm-hmm. is it not? But one of the things you can get from sort of deepening your character is more opportunity for a spotlight because if if you come to your character and go okay i'm not just going to be the high dexterity rogue i'm going to be the high dexterity rogue who really really has a thing for this npc in the city and can we can we incorporate that somehow i've got this story idea and you are now no longer reliant on the person at the far end of the table to be providing all the hooks and all the material for you to engage with you are now starting to collaborate and in the act of collaboration you are giving yourself and other people a chance to have the spotlight you are giving your chance the opportunity to have moments that are special to you like oh i finally get to be the big deal for a week that's cool i finally get to be the one who gets to say the quippy thing or (laughs) or stab the right person in the face or do the whatever and those you're only helping yourself and and say and or secondarily you are also helping everyone else because now the story is becoming much more involved beyond just like okay you roll some dice okay now it's your turn you roll dice you are you you're you're contributing more to the imaginative story you're not just waiting your turn to move your hand and then scribble on a piece of paper And then we go around and around and around until we realize like, oh, God, it's late. I have work in the morning. Fake Mm -hmm. yawn. I guess you guys better go now. You're making it matter. You're making it mean something. So the advantage of getting past the stats and past the character sheet is that you are you are truly playing the role. Yeah. And if everybody has these deep characters, you can easily intermix everybody's stories through play. And now when your friend is having their time in the spotlight or their turn in combat, you're actively more invested in what they are doing because you know that it could potentially affect your character as well as everybody else's characters at the table. Yeah, it's a more memorable story. And I think it Mm -hmm. it does more to keep people off of their phones and things like that, too, because, you know, I know when I when I play with other people who like to have those really in-depth character moments, I, I don't want to look away because it's like, oh, I need to see what's happening with yeah. your character. I need to see what you're doing and what's going on because I'm actively interested in knowing. Um, I, I don't want to take my attention away from that. So I think it's a better experience for other people too, mm-hmm. even when you're having those moments and you're the one in the spotlight. Yeah, exactly. I, if you are playing with people that have these deep characters you're able to enjoy their narrative, whether or not it affects you or not, 
because it's interesting. It's fun. You're creating this more intense story rather than how many people did we kill today? How much experience did we get? And how much loot do I get? Right. It's a better experience long term. You're going to remember it more. You're going to care more, I think, about those characters, about the story that you're telling. Because I I think that's an important part, too, is that we got to collaborate and tell the story together. And that's always really exciting to me. Personally, I have a really hard time writing or coming up with ideas on my own. I do really well when I can bounce things off of other people. And that's one of my favorite parts of role-playing games is getting that chance to tell a collaborative story. And then at the end, it's this thing that you all collectively have ownership of. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more in-depth and fleshed out your characters are, the better product you're going to walk away with. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which is really what you want. That's why you sat down. That's why you shelled out the money for the books. That's why you made time in your possibly non-sweat-panted busy schedule to sit down and hang out with humans. <laughs> so anything you could do to give yourself that experience or give yourself the possibility of that experience, I think you should do. So do you know if there's any uh, techniques or tools that you would suggest that authors would use uh, that we could actually use to add depth to our characters around the table? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll even do it with a shameless plug. Nope. So, uh, I have, I'm on record in a couple places as having a very visceral and aggressive response to NaNoWriMo. That's National Novel Writing Month. Mm -hmm. uh, it and I are not simpatico. It and I do not see eye to eye. I, I frequently in October make many, many comments as to <laughs> why I think it is uh, a really nice thing, but not ultimately a functional thing if you're trying to really dive into writing and push yourself to do it. So I made uh, a couple years ago, I made a thing called Fioshimo, which is my uh, immediate response. It's it's fix your stuff month. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's opposed to follow right after NaNoWriMo. NaNoWriMo, if, if you don't know what it is, it's supposed to be 30 days where you, you write and you're, you're supposed to reach an arbitrary number of words. Um, but it doesn't tell you what to do after that or it very seldom tells you what to do or it doesn't tell you clearly enough to make it actionable. So I made Fioshimo as a way to give you what – well, what do you do now? Now you wrote a thing. Now what? Now now you start to edit it. Now you break it down. Well, how do I break it down? Fioshimo is a 30-day breakdown of everything you need to do. Uh, part of that is a section on characters which is immediately applicable around a table and it's things like give your character skills. And give your character strengths and weaknesses and give your character goals and give your character fears and not just like, I'm afraid of snakes, so that's a 10 point disadvantage. I've got extra points now to give myself cool powers, but like a, a fear you will actually act on, like a fear that could impact and influence how you do stuff at the table. Um, because I think way there, there was a rash, a spate of games, if you will, where, um, People would just load up on all manner of disadvantages in a point buy system to have more opportunities to buy stuff. A lot of flaws so that I could have the really cool merits. And it completely discredits the nature of the flaw. It, it completely erodes the idea of what it means. So you you start looking at, at fears and goals and wants and philosophy, what we talked about before, as ways to make this character feel more than just like, well, this is my main character. They are a person who is a job who has a quest and, and they become more actualized. They, come, they become more developed. It's not just, well, I am a college professor who doesn't really teach college classes i instead prefer to go out on adventures and i have a hat and a whip it suddenly becomes way more developed because now it's well i am a grown man with issues of faith self-confidence father issues family structure dynamics uh, a willingness to get into trouble a very strange way of falling down and a constant need to put myself in harm's way for the sake of other people so, but also a fear of snakes. But also a fear of snakes. Yep. So, so, so these developments, <laughs> these things all stack together and tie together in in ways that aren't terribly difficult decision wise. It's well, what's your character's goal? What does your character want? It it goes beyond just well, they want to complete the plot. Well, 
great. That's kind of a given because the plot's part of the story. Like, what else do they want? Do they want, like, an ice cream cone? Do they want a slushie? Do they want to go to bed on time? You know, do they just want to make it to retirement? Do they want someone to love them? It can be as intense or tiny as as they want, but it's got to be something. Fioshimo's stretch of character development days came straight out of role-playing for me because some of those elements don't really show up in English class textbooks when it's talking about, well, here's how you write a main character. So that's weaknesses, strengths, flaws, skills, fears, goals, moral compass, um, just to kind of give them a place in the world because it's it's really frustrating to have the character but not really have them fit in. So, so those would be the tools I would recommend. John, you work with writers a lot. Are there really common pitfalls that you tend to see over and over again in people trying to create interesting characters and not quite getting there? How many hours do we have? There, there are tons of common pitfalls. And they're all the, – the, the, what makes it so difficult is that they are so often well-intentioned. No one's mm-hmm. no one sits down to purposely make a bad character. Or right. if they do, they're doing it in an intentionally satirical or comedic way, expressly to poke fun at things. So common pitfall number one is probably they just stack cliches together in a, in a few different salad arrangements and hope that just because, you know, here are five cliches, but I'm starting with the fourth one, all of a sudden that counts as a new thing. Or they look at the genre they're writing or they look at the, the, the idea that the, the field they're playing in and go, well, the really popular move is that, you know, all paladins are either going to be fourth, you know, forthright Boy Scouts or lawful stupid or the paragon of virtue. You're never you, – and, and you, you use that as too much of a template. I can't stray too far from that because then I'm not being a paladin. I'm, I'm being something else. But that conflict is interesting. And I think people too often shy away from conflict for the sake of comfort because we can write comfort. Because we, we have other examples of things where we can stay in the ballpark and say, oh, well, we're, we're in the comfort zone. We're writing familiar – easy material. I don't have to push myself so hard because there's enough on my plate. It's stressful to write a novel. It's stressful to, to draft and revise and query and be rejected and feel judged and then worry have to about marketing and sales and all this stuff. So if I just stay comfortable, if I just kind of stay in this familiar, cliche, rich jungle, then it'll be okay. It, it won't be okay. It, it will not be okay. There's no okay to be had there. You will get lost. You will be one more rubber duck sailing down the river as opposed to the thing sailing upstream that everybody wants to try and catch. So pitfall number one, reorganization of cliches and packaging, packaging them as new. These are in no particular order. I'm thinking of them off the top of my head. Common pitfall number two, <laughs> uh, really horrendous name. A really, really bad name that comes too early in the character creation process can very easily water down or, or stifle the rest of the character, make the thing yeah. and then name it because you, there's a whole world of difference between naming that character Doreen, who sounds a little like a school nurse. Cause that's the Doreen I pictured in my head. And <laughs> you know, someone like Agatha, the 1920s, you know, suffragette who's ready to like leap in front of the rail car to, you know, crush the man who's been holding her down because she secretly, you know, is going to firebomb the factory and then blame it on those three dudes over there. It immediately becomes more evocative. The name should be a bridge rather than a wall when you're developing potential. Uh, Item number three convincing themselves and therefore trying to convince other people that tragedy is inherently more interesting, especially mysterious tragedy. I don't know if you know this, but the world is not really populated with that many wounded, deeply hurt loners who are just traveling the world in search of like someone who really understands me in a very breathy way, which is why I've tussled my hair and I've got a little bit of stubble and I probably have a jacket and, you know, I don't want to talk about my past. <laughs> and and it gets very melodramatic and it gets very intense. Tragedy is more interesting when tragedy is present. Because if we're, if 
you are currently living the tragedy, if you are currently embodying the guy who, or the lady or the person who is conflicted about this fact about themselves or this fact about the world that violates one of their preconceived notions, it's way more, ooh, I get to play in this space where I get to make up my own mind and make some new decisions and have some mm-hmm. new causes and new effects versus the – I'm still trying to deal with the death of my partner from four years ago, and it weighs on me every day. To this day, I still can't eat oatmeal. That's <laughs> that's funny, but it is not necessarily as deeply moving or as experiential around the table to really have an impact on other people. If you come to the table as that player or write that character in the story as currently going through that pain rather than just I can't eat oatmeal without thinking about her. That's that's probably true, but then it all of a sudden becomes about the oatmeal rather than the loss that mm-hmm. oatmeal comes to symbolize. And ultimately then the arc of your character would be to go eat oatmeal. Um I guess. <laughs> uh other other pitfall. Uh there's no clear arc. And you see this in gaming too. Yeah. Because what happens when your players reach tenth level? Oh, well, they go have keeps and then go make a new character. Why? They they just stop. They're done. It's only 10 levels. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> oh, OK. Well, what if you run like a Monty Hall power GM game and I got four levels in the first night? So but without having an arc, without having a, a question to answer or a challenge to resolve or a, mm-hmm. a, a void inside themselves to fill with something, there's no real direction for them for them to go. Superman's only interesting because of the space rock. How the character fills that hole, which doesn't sound the way I want to make it sound now that I say it out loud, but in my head it totally (laughs) made sense. But how the character sort of fills that hole and makes themselves complete becomes more interesting because it gives them a direction and in that direction they can make choices and then see the consequences of the choices explored through the world or through the GM or through the this or through the that. But it's because they have a, a purpose and a direction. They're not just sort of meandering conveniently from vignette to vignette. Oh, I guess I'm at the store in this chapter. Oh, I'm over here. It 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 matters. It You need a direction. You need a purpose. Just like your character Mm -hmm. needs a reason to go from level one to level two rather than just, well, I killed ten rats and I've returned this quest to the guy with the exclamation point over his head. So it it matters. And and giving that arc some meaning beyond just, you know, go collect ten boar pelts and then level up and then you'll get copper tools. That, That matters. So, yeah, give your character an arc. Give your character something to do. Making your villain not the immediate opposite of your character and vice versa. Yes, it's really easy to say, well, my character is one side of the binary and therefore the villain is the other side of the binary. But ultimately, the fact that it's a one-to-one ratio will forever cancel cancel one side out. You know, oh, well, I have fire. Well, I have water. Oh, I have paper. You have rock. Great. It's not until we introduce scissors into the mix that we really start talking about something. I think those conflicts are always inherently more interesting because they always seem higher stakes, too. Yeah, absolutely. When when things are the opposite, it's like, well, I'm red and you're white and then that's like, we can never be friends. But like, it's when people are close but just just different enough that level Mm -hmm. of conflict feels so much greater and so much more like imperative to solve than it does when you're just totally opposite Mm -hmm. i like those stories better because if, (laughs) if if you diverge far enough apart there's less reason for either side to change or be affected by the other you it's it's gotta you've gotta step inward and whether that's inward towards other characters or in a in a deeper John tweet thread sort of way, inward in yourself to find the more interesting crisis and conflict points that you can extrapolate for the sake of stakes. Why is this a big deal to you? Yeah, that's there. There's so many uh, great examples of that too. Uh, one thing that I was thinking of when you were saying that is kind of like Charles Xavier and Magneto, um, who are two people that kind of were along the same path with uh you know different reactions towards everything that was happening around them and they were great friends but then i got to do this for you know this reason and you have to do this for this reason and that's why we're against each other but i wish we weren't right and that point where things diverge is always like 
it's so interesting to me. And I'm sure different people get different things out of stories. But that point where things start to diverge is always like the most interesting moral quandary to me. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting element is the I wish we weren't. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then it means that we are not ruled by this conflict. We are just present with it and it is a part of us, but it is not our sole defining factor. And I think mm -hmm. that can be really amazing when played out, not just among novel characters, but even at a table. Well, and I think that it, it narrows down then the number of choices for a solution to that problem too, right? It's when you take your, you know magneto reference and you say like well we don't really want to be at odds well then you say okay so walking up and just outright killing this person is not a choice then like yeah. that's you know i mean or maybe it is but it's it's certainly a more difficult one to make and so you've sort of narrowed down the scope of possible solutions to that problem which means a lot of times having to think of more interesting solutions to that problem too mm -hmm. Yeah, and the minute you're thinking about more interesting anything, you are you are immediately deepening the character because if the solution is just oh well I'll, I'll shoot the guy, well okay that's that's what are we going to do for the other forty one minutes we're sitting here, mm -hmm. you know right like, you've you've yes you've solved the problem, but we weren't only here to have that problem solved we were here mm -hmm. to experience the problem in the context and our own interactions with it. But yeah, go ahead and kill the guy. See see what happens. I'll I'll see you next week. Yeah. An another trait that we as humans embody is uh, a lot of our flaws and adding flaws to characters tends to make them a lot more interesting. So what would you say to people who are kind of hesitant to add flaws to their characters? Your character doesn't have to be perfect to be interesting. Right. And you the player are good enough as a person and you will still be a friend of all your friends at the table if you make a character who is different from perfect. You can, yep. you can, well, well, because one of the fears we, we normally have is the idea that like, oh, well, if I play a character this way, I'm going to be judged. When you start deviating from where you think your friend's expectations are, that's where you start moving into that space where it's, oh my God, they could, they could judge me. They could kick me out. What if I, what if I say a thing and, and like, well, they've got microphones and I, and, and they could tell me to go like suck eggs and then I'm out the door and I will have, you know, spent my entire evening talking about nothing because this will just follow to the wayside. So, oh my God, the fear of judgment and the possibility of rejection is now causing me to overmodulate and panic internally about the stuff that's going on. But it's okay because you have flaws. You're a person, person listening to this who wants to play a character with flaws. You have flaws. I, I don't know what they are. I don't care how severe they are. You have them. So does the person who sits next to you and the person across from you and the person you work with and your parents and your partner and the other person you know and the five other people you know. We all have flaws. But there are also opportunities and permission slips and hall passes to allow you to sneak past things that you would otherwise not be able to do. Because, oh, well, I, I actually don't know a lot about being a pirate. So I'm going to play a pirate who doesn't know a lot about being a pirate. But it's not me. It's the character, you guys. It's the character. And I can I can use the character as a vehicle to role play but also disguise my actual lack of piratical knowledge well i know you know me personally i tend to crack under authority figures okay so my character i'm going to play the character that goes the other way my character is a stubborn pig-headed unlistening unyielding stalwart guy great so what would my character do in this situation? Well, he's got a 17th strength, so I'm pretty sure he's going to tackle this dude. And then we're going to finally break out those grappling rules everybody loves. Well, maybe that's not an option we can do like with my neighbor who keeps chainsawing trees at 7 o'clock at night. <laughs> but I think I can certainly stand there and go like, hey, what are you doing, man? Like, wh wh why? You couldn't wait until like the weekend? It's just a few days away. Like... Also, dude, like that tree fell perilously close to like my bushes. What up? I'm a huge proponent of like what you can learn about yourself and what you can learn about real life situations in role playing games. They are so useful for playing out those kinds of fears and flaws and failures in a safe environment. Like 
in a place where hopefully if you're playing with the right group of people that you're not going to be judged, but also where they don't have long-term consequences. You know, like in your example, you cannot go tackle your neighbor. That would have a long-term consequence. But in a game, you certainly could, you know, and you could play that out and see what happens. Like that's a really good way to deal with those kinds of concerns. I think any creative experience is an opportunity to learn something if you're willing to be taught by it. So whether you are sitting down writing a draft about chapter three where character one reveals that they are secretly in love with character two because you yourself are secretly in love with some other person and you don't quite know how to do it, but your character can write them a love letter. So you you, you get to express that idea and sort of contend with it and see it realized. Mm-hmm. That becomes more interesting. Um I, I'm going to slightly take a provocative disagreement stance with you and say that it doesn't have to necessarily be safe because one of the reasons that you get jammed up, not you specifically, but one of the reasons people can be jammed up is because they are prioritizing safety over opportunity because sometimes one of the best things we can do is change our definition of safe by expanding our comfort zone. And failure isn't failure. Failure is success training, right? Like that's that's – yeah, you're just learning as you go and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up. Your character's going to roll the one. You're going to virtually, you know, metaphorically roll the one when you open your mouth and say something on a podcast. And then you're going to kick yourself all day when no one else remembers what the hell you're talking about. But that's that's just how it is. So you still have to do. And I understand. I, I do. I sincerely do the the notion that safety is important because it is. It is. But there comes a, a moment where you got to – you put your toes up to that edge of safety and go, the result I want is just on the other side of this line. I must be brave enough to go get it because it is not going to be handed to me. And that was a, a thing that like creatively I feel like took me a while to learn because I had convinced myself that I was being um, – you know, like I, I was being pragmatic – by not doing these things because it was like well if you you know if you try to do this then here's what's going to happen and you know it's like you're just you're being pragmatic you know how it's going to go so like let's be honest with ourselves and the reality is that like by not doing it at all you've already failed at it because you just you've given up before you've even started to try to do the thing and so i feel like in the last few months personally i've decided like okay maybe just go a little bit further and and try to do the thing and see what happens because you're going to, you know, if you're going to fail either way, like you might as well fail by doing something rather than by not doing anything and at least have, you know, spent the time doing something other than sitting on your couch watching TV, which is exciting as that is, is not all there is to life and is not very creatively fulfilling. But Amelia, you're good enough to succeed. Well, I know that now because I've tried the thing. Yeah, but even 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 with the things you wish you did try or the wish you could go back and try later, you're good enough to succeed just like you're good enough to fail. And yes, being pragmatic is a wonderful way of insulating yourself if you really enjoy being comfortable on your couch. But if you really enjoy being comfortable on your couch, you've got to let go of being uncomfortable about that other thing because it's taking away from couch sitting time. So you're you're good enough to change your circumstance. You're good enough to, to tackle a new thing and, and grow and change and push and create a character and develop a thing and take a risk and raise your hand at a conference and, and you know, make a flaw in your character and, and approach a podcast and, and do whatever the... Right. Do the thing. Just do, do the thing. Do the thing. I See, it doesn't sound <laughs> right when I say it that way. I understand the sentiment is there. Do the thing. <laughs> But yes, it does come down to, am I going to do the thing or am I going to stay behind whatever layer of excuse blanket I want, whether I call that safety or whether I call that pragmatism or whether I say, well, I know it's going to happen even when you don't, because if you knew it was going to happen, I have many questions for you about what I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, So you just have to choose because – Decision making, as we talked about way at the beginning of this, decision making is the engine that drives everything, whether it's making a character or writing a novel or making a podcast or putting on shoes or going out and buying ice cream or or getting a pacemaker or juggling or who knows what. It's decision making. And decision making is bred out of courage and frustration. Courage to change and frustration with current circumstance that warrants saying, hey, you know what? I got to change something. When people are making characters and kind of trying to add this depth to them, 
Are there specific things that you would strongly suggest people avoid? We've talked a little bit about pitfalls that people kind of accidentally fall into, but are there things that you're like, no, definitely don't do this? Yes. Uh, a few things. One, don't stop halfway. Don't don't settle. One of the temptations, especially in a, in a, in a character creation system that might be really crunchy or might have a lot of parts, particularly if your game has the word master in the title, you, you might want to feel like, oh, oh, God, how many more times am I going to roll on table K4? And and this is too, I've got to do calculus now. Like, what is this? It's too much. And you might feel tempted to just kind of breeze through it because you want to get to the air quotes. Good stuff. Don't. Don't just go, oh, I'll make the backstory up on the fly. Give yourself at least a couple bullet points. Don't don't let it be just this solo organic thing that will just bubble up and, oh, whatever, there's this and there's this because it'll eventually you'll start being unable to keep it all straight because it'll be too dynamic and too fluid. Write it down. Take some notes. If you're going to do a thing, do the thing. Uh, two, don't do – don't intentionally be the contrarian. If you're just having opposite day and you're the only one participating in opposite day, it's it's not going to be as fun for you as you originally thought and it's going to kind of harsh the buzz of all the other people involved because, well, you're the only one having opposite day and it makes you kind <laughs> of a knob. So, so, so maybe, maybe don't do that. Third thing, be willing to fail and be willing to be wrong. Don't assume that you've got to always roll well or always do the 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 big thing in order to succeed or have a good time or make an interesting character. Like your character isn't only interesting because you roll an 18 and you leap across the chasm. That's an interesting thing your character does, but it is not the sole reason for your character's existence. Unless it is, which is a really interesting story and a much different kind of character than we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like if your character is just bred to be a long jumper and this now is your moment because it's all this one long jump and there will be no more, none more long jump. Mm -hmm. This is your um, evil Knievel moment. <laughs> right. Um, good luck with Snake Canyon there, guy. Uh, let me introduce you to a thing called gravity. So good luck. But the failure can be interesting. The The potential we store and tie into the idea of, well, I need this to be a thing, even though it's not really a need. But the, the it better work out versus, oh, no, it doesn't, all of a sudden allows us to draw on our deeper well of character resources. So it's okay to fail. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay, you know, Gary's not going to stop being your friend because you decided you didn't want to be a gnome. You were going to be an elf. Now, if Gary stops being your friend because you decided to be an elf, Gary. <laughs> Gary's a jerk. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. don't want to be friends with Gary anyway. No, Don't be no. a Gary. <laughs> don't be Gary. Don't be Gary, you guys. But don't assume that just because you failed, you've undone all your identity. and You've undone all the groundwork you've laid across however many sessions, however many games. Yeah, you, you, you missed that one shot there, guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you'll have other shots. You'll, you'll cast other spells. You'll uh, surely fight other kobolds or, or run across other dungeon related traps involving sandbags and ropes like you'll there this is not the only one ever you'll be okay just try again and that in itself can like it that can make a really interesting story too of an arc of how do you come back from that then so you got knocked down a peg this thing that you thought you were going to be really great at and it didn't go well so how do you recover from that is also a really interesting story arc for a lot of characters yeah but again, that goes back to the idea of, hey, you actually have an arc. You're not just like, yes, <laughs> OK, I, I'm here to I, I'm, I'm here to, you know, fire the third crossbow in the party for four hours. You, arcs help. Character definitions help. Boundaries help. Um, so, yes, there's loads of things you can do to deepen and enrich your character potence. Would there be any other advice that you can think of that you would want to give people who would want to try deepening their characters yeah it's gonna feel really weird and scary and it, you're gonna feel like you're doing it wrong because it's something you've never done before and mm -hmm. maybe you are doing it air quotes wrong compared to some other expectation or idea that you have but there really isn't a wrong so long as you're doing it uh don't give up um 
don't worry if it feels weird. Don't worry if it feels hard. It, it'll get better over time. Everybody, everybody screws up and messes up the first time, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's first draft is garbage. Everybody's, you know, first date is awkward. Everybody's first whatever is not as good as their 60th or their 30th or their second because you learn as you go. So iteration is to your benefit. Don't feel you have to do it because everybody else is telling you, not even if that person is on the internet or has a microphone. If <laughs> if it just doesn't feel right for you to do, don't don't feel like you must absolutely do this or else. Um, but I think it would be of benefit to you at some point. Consider it. Be open to it. If you're not open to it now, be open to it later. Mm-hmm. Think about it. At least give it a shot. Let it rattle around the brain cage. Be grateful. Be grateful for what it teaches you. Be grateful for what it illuminates for you. Be grateful for all the weird, uncomfortable stuff that happens. Be 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 grateful for the opportunity to make mistakes or to succeed or do okay or do this or do that. And and document it. Take notes. Hey, tonight I tried to be goofy. Super didn't work. Do I want to try that again? I don't know. And you, you suss it out. It will reveal things about what you want and how you go about doing things that you might not know or you might not like. And those aren't indicators that you should quit. They're things that you should question to see if you want to perpetuate or alter. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And taking something that is not perfect and tweaking it a little bit is always a good place to start rather than just throwing it out completely. And there are certain things that sometimes you, you look at it and you go, you know what, this is trash. Like, just forget it. There are times where we've all been there with certain yeah. things, but it's important to realize that sometimes all it needs is a slight adjustment exactly. rather than a complete abandonment. Yes. yes. Wonderful. I'm sure you know that <laughs> better than most people. <laughs> Not everybody's garbage draft is as bad as they swear it is. Yes, it's bad. Oh, man. Oh, man. Sometimes that stuff can be real bad. But sometimes it's not as bad. Like, every, like I hear this a lot from people that I wrote a thing. Oh, God, this, this chapter is terrible. And then I go read it because let's say they're mm-hmm. a client. I can think of a few clients who preface all their emails to me with, this chapter sucks. This is bad. And then I, I go in like thinking, okay, I am prepared for this thing to be wrong from, from the jump. And I read it and I'm like, this is really good. This is better than it was. This is This is good. Okay. Okay. Wait, oh, it's just that one line that's not working. Like, this sentence is unclear. I don't know who's talking. Or uh, this minor detail about where where are they standing when they say this. Like, it's the littlest thing that suddenly makes them say, oh, my God, the world is all screwed up. No, you just fix that sentence and it's fine. <laughs> Give yourself some credit. Like, let yourself – it's okay to admit sometimes that you did a good yes. job. Yes. I think that we spend so much time, I think especially as as kids even, um, it, and I don't know, I guess, what your upbringing was, but, like, you spend so much time of, like, don't brag, don't boast, don't, like, make a big show out of things. Um, it, so that as an adult, I spend a lot of time being like, well, it's, you know, I, like, downplaying things. And it's like, no, you know what? This thing that I did is really freaking great. And it's okay to say that. And it's okay to feel that way about your stuff. It's really okay for your paladin to put in his title that he chased hooligans out of a bar because it's a big deal to him. It's okay for me to tell you that, hey, my Kickstarter raised over $28,000 because that's a lot of money, (laughs) you guys. And and it was a big deal. Now, granted, it's not as big as some other people's Kickstarters, but I'm not in the business of measuring Kickstarters. (laughs) I'm in the business of I'm making a thing and this is how much it did. And isn't that good? Uh, Yes, I absolutely grew up. Up in a in in a machine and in an environment where it was just you got to downplay you got to tamp that down because being spotted being seen is either embarrassing or shameful and so you, you got to what do, what do you mean you play role playing games what do you mean you're doing this what do you mean you 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 want to do what these these no no that that violates the box in which other people assign to you like you can't don't violate the box John stay in this little <laughs> box that's that's where we that's where we want you to be. And it, it's, it's okay to step out of that box because there's a billion other boxes and the best boxes are the boxes of your own design. And it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay to say like, yeah, man, I had a really good time being a pirate who's not a very good pirate. It's okay. It's just okay. It's okay to be proud of yourself. Yes. Too. You don't have to wait mm-hmm. for somebody else to be proud of you. I mean, I'll- like that's a really important – it's okay to – 
be excited about your thing. Totally. And if, if you're not excited about it, why should exactly. somebody else be excited about it? And if you're unsure who else is going to be excited Absolutely. about it. I mean, I tell people on Twitter every day, if you think you have no fans, I am your fan. I don't know you. I don't have to know you. I just need to know that you're doing something cool. I like cool things. Let's put your cool thing mm-hmm. in the world. Who doesn't? I'll be proud of you. I don't know you that well, but I'll be proud of you. It matters. And it's okay to be proud and it's okay to be good and it's okay to fail and it's okay to worry and it's okay to feel like you could be judged because there are people out there who actually won't. All right. Well, thank you so much, John, for sitting down with us. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, it's been my pleasure to spend an evening with you. This has been fantastic. Wonderful. Uh, Could you just remind everybody where they can find you and uh, an abridged version of your projects? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. First and foremost, that is that is my social media home Uh, on Twitter. uh, I'm at Awesome, A-W-E-S-O-M-E underscore, that's shift in the dash key. You need the underscore, J-O-H-N. Um, or on my blog, writernextdoor.com um, slash blog. But if you go to writernextdoor.com, you'll click the blog button. You'll see it. Um, currently, I am um, I, I, I work with creatives. I help them develop cool things, whatever it is, whether it's a, a role playing game or a novel or a screenplay or a stage play or a painting or what do I have a clients doing? I have clients designing graphics. I have client. I have I have clients who are advertising various intimate apparel. I have creatives of all different flavors and all different shapes doing all different kinds of things. And if you're ever wondering, hey, how do I get from here to there? And who's going to help support me and educate me and explain some stuff and help me make this better? Well, that that's my job. That's what I do. Um, I'm also currently uh, rocking a slowly growing Patreon at patreon.com slash John helps you create uh, where I am developing all manner of educational material and interesting digressive material about like, hey, I watched this bad movie. Let's talk about why it's terrible. <laughs> or, hey, I read this book and it's really good, you guys. You should think about checking it out. So mostly, yeah, I I, I pretty much help people make cool stuff. Um, and I, I do so happily and joyfully every day, as many times a day as I can. Um, so if you're looking for me, go find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm almost always there. I start every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. I open the office. And then I'm there all the time, forever. So that is my brief summary (laughs) of where you can find me. Well, thank you so much, John, for sitting down with us. This was a lot of fun. And hopefully people will get something really, really good out of this because I think you you brought Mm -hmm. a lot for us to think about. I I would beg now, granted, I am indulgent. I would beg to have this unedited and just go up. A, because I didn't (laughs) curse you guys. uh, And... And, so and B, I'm I, you have, I'm gonna hang up and then just just a stream of profanity <laughs> like it's been it's been <laughs> stewing in the back of my head because if you, if you know me like Do, so Ryan is the what like Ryan does not swear very often like if I heard Ryan swear I would be like what's wrong is the world ending what happened and I am not like that and I want you to know that I find it equally diff- like I'm getting better at it as we go but like. Uh, Man, is it rough. This, this is like you've <laughs> sawed off one of my hands. But, I mean, I am so grateful for this opportunity to sit and talk and, and use my really cool spiffy microphone and sit in the dark because I forgot to turn the lights on. I'm I'm grateful. I, I really wanted this to be good for both of us. I wanted this to be a good experience for you recording because this is a, a thing you guys are doing. And I wanted to bring the best me I could today to you. And I really hope I've done that. And I'm just grateful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad. This was, I was, I, like, honestly, it was really, I've been excited to talk to you probably since I listened to your interview on Talking Tabletop, like, forever ago <laughs> when it first came out. Because I was like, that game sounds cool and that guy sounds cool. <laughs> so I'm excited we finally got to I, do this. I've never been somebody's cool guy, so thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stop recording. Well, thank you for letting me be the cool guy. <laughs> yes, well, thank you. Yeah, this was an absolute blast. Yeah, thank you. Character Evolution Cast, like Character Creation Cast, is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at C
Creation Cast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for today's guest can also be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like One Shot. One Shot is an actual play podcast where James D'Amato leads a rotating group of players in a self-contained adventure every month. One Shot, like us, will explore every role-playing system possible to give listeners a sample of the many possibilities in the world of role-playing.